new is that uh, uh, Mexico, uh, instead of uh, being a, a, a country that sends migrants, now has to deal with Central American migrants in Mexico and, and has to do it with, with new rules. Uh, as of today, they are facing the problems or they are facing reality because actually uh, the capacity of the government to process in Mexicans in the southern border, in the northern border, and, and uh, let them uh, stay there uh, is, is being surpassed. Very happy to have uh, a local, local talent, a local hero with us tonight, uh, Roberto Dominguez. He's the professor, a professor of international relations uh, at Suffolk University, uh, where he has taught since 2005. He has also actively represented the Mexican International Studies Association um, at the World International S uh, Studies Executive uh, meetings and uh, is chair of the EU Latin America section at uh, the European Studies Association. His research focuses on regional security governance, transatlantic relations, and perceptions of the European Union in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, he's conducted research uh, for the European Parliament, the European Commission, and the British uh, Consulate General in Miami. Uh, he has also been John Monet Fellow at the European University Institute and editor of the, okay, I don't really speak Spanish, uh, Jornal Relaciones Internacionales, maybe? Okay. <laughs> uh, at uh, UNAM Mexico. Uh, Dr. Dominguez earned his PhD in international studies from the University of Miami, and we're very pleased to welcome him to World Boston. So uh, I was really pleased to, uh, to, to receive this invitation. And, and when, the, when the, the possibility of sharing some thoughts with you uh, came up, I, I was thinking uh, about the, the, the title that, uh, that was suggested for this talk, that is uh, Partnership Tested. You know, and um, I guess the, in order to somehow to, to to provide some coherence to that to that to a very complex relationship, the relationship between the United States and Mexico, I think that uh, uh, two variables can uh, help us somehow to 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 be the the guidelines of how this relationship has uh, occurred, has happened in the past uh, thirty years. And, and um, the, the first variable is uh, related to the fact that uh, institutions matter. You know, somehow over the years in this relationship that started with the uh, Mexican independence in, in 1810, uh, the institutionalization of the bilateral relationship has gone through different stages. I will explain that. And uh, somehow uh, this variable has helped uh, to, to shield the relationship uh, against uh, several crises that have occurred in the past uh, uh, 20, 30 years in, in, this, uh, in this relationship. The second variable is uh, related to personalities. Uh, and personalities matter. So uh, uh, basically I may say that, and with personalities also the orientation in foreign policy in, in the United States and in Mexico as well. So I guess these two variables may help us to understand a little bit uh, where do we stand today as opposed to 100 years ago or 200 years ago. So uh, there's a, um, a phrase that was coined by, by a, a, a Mexican a liberal president that uh, reinvented himself in a dictator in the, um, in the 19th century. And Porfirio Diaz coined the, the, the phrase, uh, Mexico, poor Mexico, uh, so close to the United States, so far from God. You know, and uh, basically what, what he meant by that is that it, the relationship with the United States was troublesome, you know. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't forget that in the 19th century, Mexico lost half of the territory against the United States, and somehow it was a very tense relationship with the United States. But at the same time, what is interesting is that the liberals in Mexico uh, had a sense of admiration 
for the for the U.S. model, as opposed to the centralized, uh, centralized, more archaic model of the of the European states. So somehow empowerment, uh, progress was embraced by by the Mexican Revolution. And when I mentioned at the beginning of this talk these two variables, what happened is that back then, 150 years ago, 100 years ago, the relation, the level of institutionalization, the role of institutions in the bilateral relationship was very low. Personalities tend to determine back then the relationship. So let's uh, go fast forward. Uh, in the past 30 years, what do we have? Well, uh, basically uh, during the 20th century, what, uh, what the relationship experiences is uh, times of crisis and, and times of reconciliation. But particularly at the end of the Cold War, there, there are several events that have uh, uh, paved the way for further institutionalization of the relationship. But by institutionalization, what I mean is rules of the game. Uh, bureaucrats on both sides of the, of, the, of the border that understand the dimension of the bilateral problems. Uh, institutions that is not very easy to step back, and this could be the case of NAFTA, and I will elaborate about that. And it is at, at the end of the 80s and the 90s that, as you can see on the, on the screen, uh, several seminal books were published trying to define the relationship, one of them, The Limits of Friendship, uh, and distant neighbors. These two books were quite important, and the, and the main thesis of those books is how is possible that these two countries that share a, a 2,000 mile border do not understand one another, <laughs> but they have interact on a daily basis. That was the, 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 the puzzle that they, that they considered in the 80s. But what is interesting, is, as opposed to Porfirio Diaz, who considered that it was a problem to be so close to the United States, at the end of the 80s, being close to the United States perhaps was a boon, was something positive, was something that Mexicans took, uh, can take advantage of. So the limits of friendship, distant neighbor, neighbors, uh, somehow reveal a, a new understanding of the bilateral relationship. And later, there was a, there was a book that somehow uh, set the strategy for NAFTA negotiations in the early 90s. Uh, Sidney uh, Wentrop uh, published the book, A Marriage of Convenience. <laughs> and I guess this title is very, is very telling because it was unthinkable in the, in the early 90s that one underdeveloped nation will have a free trade agreement with the most powerful country in the world. And it happened. This is called NAFTA. So what were the driving forces for NAFTA? And somehow this uh, title is reflecting that it was a marriage of convenience. Later, some uh, uh, scholars and politicians, uh, President Vicente Fox, were quite enthusiastic about deepening the relationship. And basically what they, have in, they had in mind was to replicate the European Union model. In other words, we have a free trade agreement. What we have to do is to deepen this relationship because if we share common interests, we can solve problems. And it was interesting that uh, the North American idea uh, uh, by Robert Pastor actually set up cer certain institutions, a model for North America, supranational institutions, a North American par a parliament. Perhaps he went too far. But somehow this was reflecting uh, a good spirit in North America regarding the, the the bilateral relationship that, by the way, at this point we talk about uh, North America. And we include Canada, obviously. You know, that sense of community somehow was uh, moving uh, in that direction. 9-11 uh, uh, happened, and that derailed this, uh, this process, you know. Uh, uh, and later, uh, more recently, one of the most influential books about the bilateral relationship was titled Vanishing Frontiers. And this was actually published a few months ago, but one of the most important experts in the field and in spite of the, what we read on the headlines, <laughs> uh, he presents evidence about how frontiers and borders between Mexico and the United States somehow are relative. And there are many, many uh, uh, structural elements that actually make difficult to detach uh, 
and to reduce the interdependence between Mexico and the United States. In other words, it would seem that a, a geography is a destiny, but uh, we can produce the time of border we want. And from this uh, assumption, what happens is that if we compare what is happening today to what it was happening in the, uh, 100 years ago, it would seem that there are several institutions, interactions, and many different levels of difference of business people, scholars, uh, uh, politicians, decision makers, that somehow make difficult to uh, uh, derail the very deep relationship between the United States and Mexico. And I guess what you have in mind now is that in the past uh, two years, actually the president of the United States has, has been uh, not very kind with, uh, with Mexico. And in this regard, the, the main assumption or the assessment uh, that I, I, will write, I would like to reach at the end of this talk is that uh, uh, the main problem that, uh, or the main challenge that we have today in, in the uh, relationship between the United States and, and Mexico is, 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 is about the, the narrative. The narrative coming from the, from the White House. However, the positive or the bright side of this is that over time, particularly in the past 30 years, there are several structure, structural forces that include the economy, in, in, include uh, trade, that include investment, that include uh, educational exchanges, that somehow uh, are resilient to the, to the statements or to the narratives that tend to be negative about, uh, about the bilateral relationship. So uh, let me expand uh, about this basic uh, idea. So uh, crises are not new. The, the, and the Mexican relationship has moved from crisis to crisis. Uh, in the 70s and the 80s, uh, uh, the United States and Mexico went on, were on opposite sides of the, uh, regarding the, the Central American uh, civil wars. Uh, in 1969, uh, Nixon uh, launched the Operation Intercept, in, in which basically he closed the border, you know, slowed down the, the crossing in the borders because uh, back then the main problem was drug trafficking. It was out of control. So there was a war again against drug trafficking uh, uh, that was coming, all the drugs that were coming from, from Mexico. In 1985, when the, the uh, agent was killed in Guadalajara, Mexico, and as a result of that, basically, uh, the United States tried to apply the extraterritoriality of the laws, may, meaning that basically they kidnap one of the doctors who, uh, in principle, uh, torture uh, Enrique Camarena, this uh, DAA agent, and they, they uh, flew him back to the United States to be presented to the courts. At the end of the day, the, the US courts declared that they could not prosecute <laughs> this doctor because he was kidnapped and the way he was brought into the United States was illegal. But just these are some examples that are presenting uh, some of the problems that the bilateral relationship has gone through in the past uh, 30 years. So uh, as it happens with any type of intense relationship, crisis. <laughs> Disputes uh, come on a regular basis. The most recent uh, disputes, dispute came in, in 2003 regarding the, um, uh, the invasion to Iraq. At that point, uh, President Vicente Fox and, and, and President uh, George W. Bush actually developed some uh, empathy. Actually, both were, the, their backgrounds were similar. Uh, they wanted to, to deepen the bilateral relationship, but 9-11 basically uh, uh, brought these two countries apart, and they, these two countries actually went on opposite sides in, in, in the Security Council. It went on opposite sides in U.S. foreign policy, and at the end of the day, basically the relationship between 2002 until 2006 between the United States and Mexico at the executive level was frozen. It was until President Obama was elected in 
uh, uh, and, uh, President Felipe Calderón was elected in Mexico, that somehow the relationship was relaunched uh, again. So crises are not new, but I, there are also good news, you know. Not everything is about crisis, you know. The, the, the problem are not necessarily the crisis, because crises and problems will come up uh, on a regular basis. It, the, the structural forces that are happening in this relationship today somehow indicate that uh, Mexico is a, is a very reliable partner. Mexico is the third trade partner of the United States, and this is not in 2019, it has been for the past three years. The trading goods is uh, uh, close to $6 billion uh, per year. And uh, uh, President Trump uh, has mentioned that uh, there is a trade deficit in goods with Mexico, which is uh, $81 billion. But uh, the, if we put this in perspective, that represents only 7% of the trade deficit of the United States. So in other words, the trade deficit uh, between the United States and Mexico, or the problem is somewhere else, not with Mexico. Not to say that actually many jobs, approximately five, uh, close to six million jobs, are uh, depend on uh, US exports to Mexico, to products that will be manufactured in Mexico and will be exported again to the United States. So in this regard, uh, the deficit with Mexico is not really a problem. <laughs> it's not really a problem because there is a, a permanent circulation of goods and, and, and supplies for that production in Mexico. Many of the inputs for production in Mexico are actually are coming from the United States. And uh, the investment. The investment uh, uh, grew from 17 uh, billion in 1993 to 110 today. So it, it has been a, a phenomenal, a phenomenal uh, transformation in the bilateral uh, relationship. And if we put this in in, in perspective, uh, every minute, one million dollars of products are crossing the border between Mexico and the United States. And if we calculate the land crossings on the border, uh, one million people are crossing the borders between Mexico and the United States every day. Yes. So uh, this, is, this is telling us somehow uh, that uh, structure that, that, has, that Mexico and the United States have created. But in order to regulate those structures, you need uh, diplomats. You need rules of the game. You need uh, uh, law enforcement. And this is already happening. This very deep and active relationship wouldn't be possible without the bureaucratic structure, the government structure, the diplomatic structure, and the economic forces that are uh, happening every day in the relationship. So what is new? What is new? Having in mind that uh, it, this is not the, the, early 19, the early 20th century with Porfirio Diaz, <laughs> that in, in, in 2019, what we have is a very strong relationship, what we call interdependence, uh, that somehow this relationship has been resilient. Many crises have occurred in the past 20 years. And at the end of the day, uh, both countries have found a way to deal with those crises. Uh, but what is new in the, in the eyes of the observers is the, the, the diplomatic tone is the, the, the diplomatic bullying, mostly coming from the White House. And this is not minor in the case of Mexico. And let's try to be as objective as possible. Uh, we shouldn't forget that in June 16, on June 16, 2015, and you have the, the statement there, President Trump announced his uh, campaign based on the assumption the Mexicans uh, are rapists, all what you have heard, and he will build a, ball, a wall. So this is quite problematic, because it, it is not only about Mexicans. <laughs> it is about Hispanics. There is a confusion who is the target. Uh, we, should, we should not forget that uh, around 38 million people are Mexican or Mex Mexican descent in the United States. Uh, so it's, it's really hard to put a label on one group when actually uh, that group is quite active in the, in the United States and they contribute to the, to the economy. So uh, this is what we call a nativist way of thinking. And this nativist uh, way of thinking is not exclusive of President Trump. Uh, we have uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil also following these steps. Uh, uh, Hungary is another case, Philippines with Duterte. 
Uh, we have several leaders around the world that somehow, perhaps be the, because of the convergence of several forces, they found a historical moment in order to sublimate the fears of people. And uh, uh, this is the result. This is what we have today. So, uh, and this is problematic. So, but there are good news. <laughs> there are good news about this. Uh, and the sense that, um, or the idea that I want to convey is that by talking with diplomats, by talking with uh, some decision makers, there is a sense that the way to describe the bilateral relationship today is that uh, there's a, a, a a force within, within the White House that is sending message for political consumption and for the domestic audiences. But when you talk with the generals or the diplomats, they tend to tell you, you know, actually in their relationship, again, we are trying to find solutions to the problems. <laughs> we are trying to figure out how to address structural problems. Rather, and we sit and talk. And actually, that is, that is happening uh, at the level of the, of the diplomats, at the level of the uh, generals, uh, because there is military cooperation, uh, at the level of uh, law enforcement uh, agencies. So three, three examples to, to illustrate what I'm, what I'm saying. In the case of migration. In the case of migration, uh, uh, today the... <sighs> When we talk about Mexicans, it would seem that we refer to Latin Americans or Central Americans, and, and, and this is highly problematic, because in the, in the case of Mexico, actually the migration, the net migration to the United States has been declining since 2010. And in 2010, the experts in immigration were saying, well, is this episodic? It's not episodic. It seems more the convergence of several uh, factors. One of them is that the, the, the Mexican population is becoming older. Uh, the other one is that somehow there are some opportunities, more opportunities in Mexico. Uh, the, the other one, the 2008 crisis, was also a push factor. And when you put them together, what we have seen at least now for nine years is that actually the, the number of immigrants from Mexico is declining. So by the time of 2015, when President Trump mentioned that the problems were Mexicans, actually the population was already declining. Uh, and the challenge today, and I guess we will see in the coming months, uh, this uh, problem and the solution, or the potential way to manage this problem evolving, is that Mexico has become uh, a third safe country today, de facto. If you ask uh, the, the minister or the foreign affairs in Mexico, it's very likely that they, he will say no. The argument is that uh, we will not behave as the American government is behaving. What we'll do, we will try, we will try, try to respect the, the Central American migrants. And de facto, what is happening, I was just uh, last week in, in Tijuana on the border, and what is happening is that uh, uh, the United States, uh, in, in an informal agreement uh, somehow, has uh, reached uh, the, uh, the agreement that uh, Central Americans will try to process with, uh, their paperwork for asylum in the United States while they, while they stay in Mexico, okay? So this is, this is not a solution because now <laughs> it's becoming a problem for the Mexican government that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the person who is running for mayor in, in, in Tijuana today, one of the main uh, political flags is precisely this one, you know? We cannot host Central Americans here in Tijuana, and we cannot do the dirty job of the Americans. This is the argument that they are mentioning in the campaigns. So uh, today, literally today, the Commission for uh, the Economic Commission for Latin America of the United Nations and, and Alicia Barcena uh, presented a, a proposal, 20 in between 30 and 30 points regarding how to develop a long-term development uh, strategy regarding Central America. So what has happened, what is new, is that uh, uh, Mexico 
uh, instead of uh, being a, a, a country that sends migrants, now has to deal with Central American migrants in Mexico and, and has to do it with, with new rules. Uh, as of today, they are facing the problems or they are facing reality because actually uh, the capacity of the government to process in Mexicans in the southern border, in the northern border, and, and uh, let them uh, stay there uh, is, is being surpassed somehow. So uh, it, let's see to what extent the, the United States is engaged in this, in, in this uh, project. So regarding trade, you know, uh, in terms of trade, the, just yesterday or over the weekend, uh, one of the, of the main obstacles to send to Congress uh, or to ratification the, the, the NAFTA, the new NAFTA, the so-called uh, US, USMCA, United States, Mexico, and Canada, uh, was solved, which is the case that, uh, the case of steel and aluminum. Just uh, over the weekend, the United States, Mexico, and Canada, now I, I we're glad to hear that the United States will lift the tariff on, on, on steel and aluminum. And this was very important because somehow uh, uh, this, was, uh, this was on the table that uh, the new NAFTA agreement would not be sent to, the, to Congress if this problem was not solved before. So, uh, again, there's a problem. Somehow the three countries found a, a solution. And uh, uh, we shouldn't forget that one of the main goals of the Trump administration was precisely to re renegotiate NAFTA. That already happened. Negotiations concluded last year, and the, and the agreement was initialized uh, in November 30th by the three countries. So now is just to remove some obstacles. One of them is precisely the case of aluminum or steel that was removed over the weekend. And it's very likely that in the coming months, the new NAFTA will be, uh, will be uh, sent for ratification process. The third, the third topic, which is organized crime. This is highly problematic. And this is perhaps the, the, the most complex and the one that I would be more concerned. Because what happens in, in, in Mexico is, is that the, 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 the collateral damage of organized crime is very high. Um, and as you can see, just to put in perspective, uh, uh, you can see the numbers. Uh, close to 20,000 people killed every year as a result of this collateral damage. By that, I mean that it, these, uh, these are uh, people that are uh, homicides related to organized crime. You know? So uh, it's very high. If we consider this in, in terms of 100,000 people uh, killed, uh, 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 the number of uh, people, uh, homicides in the United States per 100,000 people is three. In Mexico, is close to 25, 28, 35. It's really high. You know, and perhaps, uh, uh, no, and in Central America, it's worse. It's close to 60. Venezuela, close to 80. So uh, this is a big problem. But this is more a, 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 a domestic problem. A domestic problem that somehow, again, the United States and Mexico have been trying to address. And they address, started addressing this in, more, in a more assertive way with a so-called merit initiative that started in 2008. And they tried basically to work on two different areas. One is to help the Mexican governments to, to disrupt the capacity of organized crime. The other one is to make Mexican institutions stronger. Uh, the other one is to create a safer border. And the final one is to help communities to be resilient to organized crime. What is the problem with the Merit, Merit Initiative? Is that came very late in 2008, 2009, and the amount of resources allocated is very small. It's just to close to $140 million, which is in, in the large scale a very limited number when you consider that you have to procure a training, that, that, that you have, I mean, it's a very complex uh, problem. So uh, to conclude, so uh, what, what is the, um, the test of the partnership? You know? So uh, what we can see so far, is that uh, the, the communication between the executives somehow has been cordial but distant. Uh, I guess they, they, they don't know each other personally. They have communicated uh, just uh, through translator, or third persons, or, or via phone. Uh, 
Uh, there are no prospects of President Trump visiting Mexico. There are no prospects of President Lopez Obrador visiting the United States. Uh, somehow it's cordial but distant. Uh, there are personal relationships, and I guess uh, here is uh, w somehow the second variable that I mentioned at the beginning, that somehow these structural forces, these, uh, the, the business people, the, the politicians, the diplomats, somehow they had forged a network that uh, has worked, because if we consider that uh, the Mary Initiative is, is, is still alive, if we consider that there is a new NAFTA, if we consider that there are talks about how to address the problem in Central America, is that in spite of the fact that there is a very uh, acrimonious language uh, uh, on the headlines uh, coming from the White House, uh, uh, we know that there are high stakes in the relationship and somehow talks continue uh, at uh, different levels. In migration, the main challenge uh, ahead of us is uh, how to deal with Mexico as a, as a safe third country. And um, this is very difficult. Uh, some uh, circles in Mexico are advocating for the Turkish style arrangement in which the European Union provided assistance in order to keep uh, Syrians uh, in, uh, in Turkey rather than coming to, to Europe. Uh, but it's still too early to call. In terms of trade, what we have seen is that after the turmoil, the negotiation has prevailed. And actually, if we see the, the terms of, in terms of disruptions in the bilateral trade, we haven't seen any. And actually, because of the tariff against China, Mexico is going to benefit about that. <laughs> because Mexico will fill that, uh, that vacuum left by the, by, the, by the Chinese. In terms of organized crime, uh, uh, this is urgent. This is urgent. Because uh, uh, what the, the United States uh, should do is somehow to support the efforts in, in Mexico, particularly regarding the new National Guard, in order to reduce the collateral damage. Uh, intelligence sharing has been uh, quite important, already exists. If you recall this uh, famous drug trafficker, El Chapo Guzman, and some others, they were captured with US intelligence. So it's already there. But this has to be deepened. And finally, in terms of global and, and regional politics, there are some divergent views, but it seems that somehow the Mexican government went back to the 70s. In the in Mexican foreign policy in the 70s was not to talk in foreign policy, to remain silent, not to intervene in other countries, even with the statements, uh, because that was a way to infringe sovereignty. Uh, there was a friction. Uh, the, uh, a uh, recent friction is uh, with regard to Venezuela. And in that regard, the United States uh, understood the position of Mexico of not, in, not uh, making any public statement uh, uh, regarding Venezuela. The position of Mexico was to mediate rather than uh, putting pressure on the, on the government, on the administ uh, Maduro administration. But uh, the overarching uh, picture is that there are, some, there are no other elements in the horizon that could indicate that there would be a major clash between the United States and Mexico as it happened in 2003 with the uh, invasion to Iraq and, and the position of Mexico in the Security Council. So uh, with this note, I, I, I will conclude. And um, I don't want to convey any, any super optimistic view about the relationship. But what, just to, to, to reiterate what I, I mentioned in the beginning, there are, there are two variables in this relationship. I guess that today, more than ever, uh, the structure and what is at stake is very high. The interdependence is high between these two countries. And in spite of the fact that uh, uh, there can be some uh, views that contest the, the, the good health of the relationship in Mexico or in the United States, it would seem that personalities are less important than the structure and the, inter the interdependence of the relationship. Thank you very much. One important aspect of the relationship between Mexico and the United States is the economy. And the Mexican economy, to the extent that it continues to develop and doesn't squander oil resources like many other countries have, is a success story. But what is your opinion of the future of the Mexican economy now with uh, AMLO, the new president? Uh, and will that not release, release some of the pressure that has been heretofore uh, solved by immigra immigration to the United States? 
re regarding the, the, the economy, it's, we are still trying to decipher uh, President Lopez Obrador. Uh, uh, I guess that uh, here, if we want to find some answers, we, we have to look at the, um, uh, the undersecretaries in the minister in the, in the Ministry of uh, the Economy. Uh, and my take is that uh, uh, actually uh, they will not put at risk the, the general model that has prevailed for the past 30 years in Mexico. The main goal that they are trying to pursue is to find better redistribution. So in that regard, I do not see Mexico moving into the direct direction of Venezuela or, or Nicaragua in the coming years, but uh, there might be some miscalculations. The, the fact that the president is considering that by attacking corruption, he will be able to allocate those resources that he considers that is around 3% of the GDP and to distribute those resources, selling the the presidential airplane, uh, living in his home, and, and some actions that might be a little bit populist, when we do the math, actually is not enough. <laughs> it's not enough. So the concern might be that uh, maybe by this time next year, the, his popularity will be declining uh, as a result of the fact that he will realize that by attacking only corruption and have, ha, having high expectations that he will develop a, a more equality because of that will not resolve. I guess at that point he will face a reality. Uh, what is needed is to reassure some uh, uh, investment, to make a good, good, good calculations in the, in the economic setting. So uh, in that regard, there's a structural problem. Just uh, two weeks ago, the, the General Secretary of the OECD, and, 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 and I guess they aligned with, um, uh, with the IMF and all the, the experts in the area uh, of, uh, that they forecast the economies, uh, they consider that what is urgent is to invest more in education, that somehow this government is trying to do, but that will pay off in the long term. Uh, what is urgent is to invest in productivity. And it seems that this is not in the, in the agenda of the president. He's more concerned about social equality. He's more concerned about uh, dealing with corruption, which I guess is good. But at the same time, my, my, uh, the positive side of this is that the, the economic team is very aware. Is very aware of the limits of the Mexican economy. And by the way, this is, this is more a structural problem of the, of the Mexican economy. So um, that's where I see the... the the economy in the in, in the in the in the coming year, I I would I don't have a crystal ball to say you know in the two coming two or three years, but there will be a readjustment of the of the model. But I do not see basically derailing the 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 current economic model. When I said current, it's the same model that has been in place for 25 years. So somehow it works, you know. What the, the main problem is to make it more accountable, is to enhance transparency. Uh, those are the, the, the areas that uh, the president should uh, tackle, in spite of the fact that he mentioned that neoliberalism is dead in Mexico. You know, well, this is more for domestic consumption. He's quite neoliberal in that regard in terms of praxis, economic praxis. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so it's been observed recently that local and state governments in the United States have re become more hostile towards um, migrants in recent yeah. years, whereas in the past, such as with Rick Perry and you know, then Arizona. Texas Governor George W. Bush, uh, they're more open to migration and to expanded trade. Um, what is, so you mentioned that the mayor of Tijuana was becoming uh, more, ho more uh, hostile to um, Central American migrants as well. What other sort of uh, regional and local dynamics have you observed in the uh, Mexico-US relations? And regarding the, the, the animosity in terms of migration here in the United States, uh, the Mexican government and the consulates uh, in the United States are quite cautious about uh, 
dealing with a local politics in the United States, there's a limit because if, if they don't want to, to, to produce an overreaction from local government saying, you know, now the Mexican government is telling us what to do at the local level. It, there has been policies for 30 years in the, designed by the Mexican foreign ministry about helping to organize Mexicans in, in their own communities. And, and it, 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 one of these initiatives is here in Boston, in many places, the network of talents, for instance. You know. And what they do, they organize meetings about talented Mexican people living locally, and to see how they can organize themselves in order to, to help uh, to, to, to undermine stereotypes, <laughs> to somehow to convey the message that not all Mexicans are rapists. You know? so, uh, but uh, I, I may say that uh, uh, the, the capacity of the Mexican government in that regard is, is, very, is very limited. So uh, now the problem is more complex because now we have similar uh, attitudes uh, from uh, local governments in Mexico regarding Central Americans. So uh, I guess uh, the time has come where uh, there must be more uh, 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 empathy, there, there must be some political pragmatism in the, in the relationship uh, and in the, uh, the level of the federal government in Mexico and uh, the federal government in the United States in order to deal with these issues in a more coherent way. And what I mean by that is a, a comprehensive immigration reform in the United States and a, basically a, a strengthening immigration policies in Mexico in order to alleviate uh, these uh, stereotypes and, and misperceptions. Yeah, some, somehow. Uh, we, we can talk maybe a little bit uh, more later. Yeah. I'm interested, if we listen to the White House and the White House only, he tells us we have an emergency on the border. In my sense, is that's a bunch of hoo-hee. Could you verify whether we really have a crisis in the Mexican border? in the United States? It's really hard to, to, to answer, you know. I, I, I may, uh, what, what I could say is that uh, something similar happened in 2014, and the response of the Obama administration was quite different. Uh, uh, today, uh, it seems that uh, uh, this crisis has been exacerbated, in, in my view. This, uh, back then in 2014, there was a wave of uh, an accompanied children coming to the United States. And basically, uh, the, uh, the administration requested several billions of dollars to Congress. He received, I guess, 20% of what he requested. But at the end of the day, uh, I remember President Biden traveling uh, several times to Central America uh, in order to figure out how to keep the people there. I, it was quite assertive. Today, uh, uh, rather than, than dealing with a, with, with a problem, it seems that uh, uh, the administration has led this to grow. That, that, could be, that would be my, my perception, and obviously with this you create a sense of crisis. You know? uh, but it's, it, it varies. It's not the same El Paso as opposed to, to San Diego. I was in San Diego just over the, last weekend, and, and, and it, the, actually the, the main problem now is El Paso that they are flying somehow people that have requested asylum to detention centers in, in, in San Diego. And, and the problem is that there is a problem with infra infrastructure, but it's not all across the border. So, so it, there are many nuances to this, to this crisis. So in my view, saying that, uh, that there's a, a crisis, uh, it, 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 it could be dangerous to call it a crisis. I, I would see, I have seen this coming on regular basis in the bilateral relationship. The problem today is that uh, uh, many of these uh, migrants or uh, many of the people in the, in the detention centers are OTMs, what they call OTMs, that is other than Mexicans. You know? And the problem with other than Mexicans is that if, are you going to send them back to Mexico? If you are going to do that, you have to get an agreement with Mexico, or are you going to send it to Central America? You know, and this produces legal issues that uh, basically we have been involved for the past two years. So I, I, I will be reluctant to say that this is a crisis. There has been, uh, as, uh, the, number, the numbers have increased, 
Uh, but I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, a crisis, you know. I wanted to pick up on the comments you made about some of the new factors, like the nativist narrative and the mercantilist mindset. Can you talk a little bit about how Mexico, um, well, of course, it's always going to be heavily dependent on the U.S., how they're starting to diversify a little bit, you know, strengthening their trade agreement with Europe and maybe starting to shop their agriculture products looking south instead of north and going to Argentina and Brazil and some of the ways they may be trying to be sort of strategic about giving themselves some plan B <laughs> options. Well, it, Mexico has, trade, it has free trade agreement with 40 countries around the world. And it is quite interesting that what we uh, see with the, uh, in the past two years with President Trump saying we have to renegotiate NAFTA or I will withdraw from NAFTA. Well, actually, Mexico was already prepared because at the same time, they were renegotiating the free trade agreement with the European Union that was getting old. It was a free trade agreement that was signed in the, in the mid-90s. But in, in that particular case, they, the EU and, the, uh, and the Mexico didn't need to scream one another. It was simply, let's adapt a, an agreement that is getting old, that is not responding to the new economic needs. So in that regard, I, I may say that uh, in Mexico, there's a, a, a very high sense of pragmatism from the economic standpoint. It's very, it would be very difficult to step back in terms of uh, uh, free trade, in terms of uh, opening the economy, in terms of uh, having a, a state that will dominate the, the economy. What is needed is more transparency, more good governance, uh, more redistribution. But you can do this with good governance at the same time. So, and, and we shouldn't forget the elephant in the room in this particular case, which is China. You know, that also is playing a very significant role. The, the, the levels of trade between Mexico and China have, have increased. And in that regard, uh, I guess that the strategy, rather than uh, diversifying the economy, what is more important is to bring more actors into the economy. It's not that much about diversifying. Whoever wants to invest, <laughs> Welcome, you know, on their, on their transparent rules. So in that regard, I guess that Mexico has been quite pragmatic in, in, in the economic issue. Yeah, I, I had a, a follow-up question about the migration issue. Um, in, uh, in, in the view of the fact that the U.S. is really not that interested in what happens in Mexico other than at the border, um, and the fact that Mexico may be realizing that they can't absorb all of these uh, refugees who are coming in who are, getting, who are not getting into the U.S., um, it is probably going to be true that the popular opinion in Mexico may ask for them to close their southern border. Is that something that you believe is likely? And also, do you, uh, is the government preparing uh, any plan to work with the Central American countries in the way that Trump claims he's doing but isn't, and uh, in order to uh, alleviate the flow uh, at its source? Uh, regarding perceptions, uh, there, has been a, there has been a couple of waves in the past 20 years. The, the perceptions of the United States uh, during the first year of the uh, George W. Bush administration was somehow uh, positive. Mexico is quite interesting. Uh, surveys have become more common in Mexico. And it, it, if you examine the history of uh, Mexico and the, and the United States, you, the, uh, a common sense will tell you, well, Mexicans don't like Americans or don't like the United States. Uh, surveys have indicated something different. Why? Because one of, uh, someone has someone who lives in the United States. The level of interconnectedness somehow is there at the societal level. Uh, at the level of uh, decision makers, uh, the interconnection with the United States is quite, uh, quite uh, frequent. So in that regard, uh, somehow the United States, uh, the, the perception has tended to be uh, neutral, positive, uh, but there has been moments. <laughs> After 9-11 and, um, and the belligerent position of the United States regarding uh, Iraq it basically dropped uh, the popularity of the United States and President Trump to very low levels. We thought that uh, we would never see something like that, you know. Uh, Obama, the perception was, uh, was really high, uh, really high in Mexico. Every time he visited Mexico, it was celebrated, it was a, a celebrity, you know. 
And uh, uh, later, uh, with President Trump, obviously, since uh, June 16, 2015, <laughs> uh, when he was at the escalators of the Trump Tower, uh, he is quite unwelcome. It may be for obvious reasons, you know, because it was Mexico the, the first target of his campaign, you know. So uh, uh, perceptions are, uh, in general, uh, are, are tend to be negative or, uh, regarding the United States and regarding President Trump, really, really uh, bad. Uh, uh, and regarding the, the, the closing the southern border, I don't know what the future holds. <laughs> uh, I, the calculation of President Lopez Obrador in the first three months was, some, uh, was somehow to deal with a problem that will go away. <laughs> uh, in that regard, uh, I guess that now they are uh, reaching the, the capacity of the Mexican state to deal with this. I, I don't know how they are going to continue dealing with a um, with flux of immigrants in the, in the coming two years. And there is no other reason than a lack of capacity, okay? And also, at some point, local people reacting to, to, to immigrants. Uh, that is why it's very important what happened today, the plan of the Economic Commission for Latin America in order to uh, help Central American countries, particularly the, the three countries, the so-called Northern Triangle, in order to deal in different directions with organized crime, with development, and having somehow uh, some type of border that is, uh, that is safe for Central America. And so uh, I... I, I hope that that will not happen. <laughs> I hope that that will not happen, but I, I will not put it out of the table that at some point the, the Mexican government will face a, a situation uh, of that dimension. I, the, the bright side of this is that in the Civil War of Guatemala, Comar, which is the Commission uh, for Refugees in Mexico, hosted uh, a significant number of Guatemalans in, in Chiapas. So uh, will this time be different? That's the question, you know. Thank you.